Welcome to Garza Guardians Week 2, Chapter 1, with Gre uh, Gary York today. Um, we will discuss a little bit about the vision of why what's, what's Garza Guardians. Um, we'll have uh, Gary talk a little bit about his ex experience and from the book, and we'll, we'll read a short excerpt from there as well. Um, just to show everyone, um, I think someone's coming in. Okay, we're all set. Someone was off mute. Um, just so, just to start for a little bit, we'll show everyone. I think most of you guys saw this from last time, but you know, this is our site here. Can everyone see that? This is our site. If you let any other officer know, they can always RSVP to these episodes. And then each one, um, you know, that has a schedule we put up last week so you can easily watch the recording. All you have to do is click and the video will show up, which is awesome. And you get to see the whole recording there. And we'll also have Gary's recording up there as well, along with their future three other weeks that we have coming up. And then also on the, one of the features that we have on here is, is you can see a lot of more of the program benefits and you can download the free booklet. You just click and it will pop up. Okay. Um, and kind of just to talk a little bit about today about like why, you know, what, what guards to guardians is, um, you know, one of the thing, one of the main things about our focus is the wellness and correct. Uh, well, like when we went to when we went into prisons, we saw one of the main uh, epidemics with corrections officers. You know, the high suicide rates, the high stress rates, um, the you know, inef like inability to be able to be effective at their jobs, um, the mental stress, PTSD, and you name it, alcohol abuse, drug abuse, um, the high divorce rates, and all of that, and one of the missions that we have here at unconditional freedom is to um how do we evolve the prison system you know how do we evolve um the prison system to 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 see that what's working what's what we have now is not working and how do we evolve that in a way that includes all aspects you know and that includes from the inmates to the corrections officers the administration um to the in the facility and one of the main, you know, kind of proponents is the guards to guardians. And we call it kind of guards to guardians, you know, because one of the main issues that corrections officers have is that the word, they don't like to be called guards, you know, and I think that's kind of a big stigma in the um, media is, you know, is, it, is that a correctional officer or just a guard? And, you know, that kind of is almost... Um, uh, minimizing the actual, you know, role and, and, and position that they have in keeping society safe and being a place, you know, of restoration for a lot of inmates. So one of our things is, is like, oh, how do we take the word guards and really change it into what we think the, the profession is a more of a noble position, which is the guardian, you know, someone who is a keeper, a protector, and, and, a, and a guide in that way for others to find their way. So that's why kind of we chose the words, the words guards to guardians. And, um, and then we know that, you know, the officers are at the center. If you're going to change anything, you, you want to address the, the people at the front lines, the people who are there day in and day out, the people whose lives are affected by it. And one of the things that we wanted to offer from guards to guardians is, is a way to help kind of dismantle a lot of the, the armor that's kind of been put on, you know, that kind of covers over, you know, the humanity. Um, you know, one of the things, you know, is, and, I, and I've, and I've been guilty of this my whole life is, is I've been very stoic and emotionless and not willing to be able to talk about either stuff that comes up for me or how do I even process things? So it's like, how do we give correctional officers the tool to process and digest the things that they've gone through, um, and helping them and then having officers come together to be able to talk about it together. So that's kind of one, um, we will, uh, you know, talk a little bit of like a little bit of the prison monastery also as well as, as kind of like what our system is in there, where we, we have the art of soul making program for inmates. Um, we have the guards to guardians program for um, correctional officers. Um, and then we also work with some prisons here in, in California with um, garden projects where we start to you know, have inmates kind of working in the fields. Um, and kind of just like growing you know, their own fruits and vegetables that end up being cooked in there. So that's kind of like a, a small vision of like a small little wrap up that we could also have Marcus later talk on um, uh, to touch on a little bit more. 
Um, so, and then, we'll, so we'll read a short excerpt from the chapter one um, and then have Gary talk a little bit about his experience. We'll do a little Q&A and then from there, uh, we'll have a short discussion and go from there. All right. So from chapter one, we have the, one of the sections is called how opening to struggle makes us, makes us stronger. Um, scientists who study the brain say that people who are able to meet life on their own terms, rather than meet it with fear or unnecessary aggression, or by freezing and shutting down, who instead cultivate a willingness to lean into their discomfort and who say yes to circumstances are those who are most consistently raised their level of performance. They do life better. They are more resilient and recover more quickly. They continually, continually expand what they're capable of physically, emotionally, and on because each incident in which they lean in willingly, their ability to perform well in challenging circumstances grows. In a very real way, they become unlimited. Similarly, scientists are now looking at stress differently. We're mostly taught that stress is bad. And when it's chronic, it's true that it can have extremely negative effects, but not all stress is bad. One psychologist, Ketty McCongill, who is an expert in stress research, describes stress simply as a signal that we're meant to move. For example, the body releases stress hormones early in the morning that make you hungry and thirsty. The stress is designed to get you to move so that you can take care of your body's needs. That's a good thing. The stress of loneliness, as McConnell describes it, feels terrible, but its underlying message is that it's moving you to connect with others. We know the human relationship relationships are essential for our health and well-being, so this is another example of stress actually serving us. As McConnell says, embracing stress is more important than reducing stress. So we're not just trying to cut off all the stress signals or live in some kind of perpetually happy place where we become disconnected from ourselves. Instead, we're becoming smarter and more thoughtful of the signals around us and becoming better judges of how we're meant to move in the world that creates the most benefit for ourselves and others. Those who learn to lean in to challenges are people who, when a battle presents itself, draw their swords and run towards it. The battle is often metaphorical, but sometimes, especially for you, it, must, it may be quite literal. These are guards who are able to deal with prison residents' defensive and aggressive behaviors with other challenging circumstances without internalizing the experience, relieving the, strengths, the stress in an unending loop or numbing their emotions. Seeing people locked up for months and years on end, seeing so many lives in confinement has the potential to be soul crushing. If you are dealing with these and other horrors of the work by shutting down your feelings, you're likely found that it's not so easy to turn back on again when you clock out and go home. When you teach yourself to become numb to circumstances that evoke a different, a difficult emotional response, it's like throwing the massive switch on an electrical box. The power to everything, the ability to really feel anything is switched off. Ben King served in the Iraq war as a psychological operations sergeant. He says it was nearly a decade because before he realized the deep psychological effects his deployment had on him. As a result of his experiences and his struggle to deal with trauma, King created Armor Down, an organization that helps service members and others who have learned to armor up as a way to cope with their work, compartmentalizing and shutting down their feelings. Learn instead how to armor down. King explains that it's not about feeling perpetual peace or losing your edge. It's about learning how to engage all of your resourceful, more effective and appropriately all day, every day. When you live from a standpoint of acceptance and accountability, King says, you can recognize when you're getting spun up and instead of getting into flat out aggressor mode, you can get into a space of being able to access, assess the situation with your highest level of processing and perceiving. And it's not that the conflict disappears, it's that whatever shows up is no longer good or bad. There's no longer, the, there's no longer that narrative. You look instead at the qualities that show up and your relationship to them. You observe how you can participate within an incident of aggression, for example, in a way that affords you 
the opportunity to control the situation without getting attached to it. You never have to turn off your feelings. Instead, you relate to them differently, using them to inform your actions. Anyone who is consistently exposed to harsh realities benefits from this ability to retain flexibility in how we relate with life. Mother Teresa, who every day was exposed to massive amounts of human suffering in the rank, dirty slums of Cal Cal Calcutta. Much of the suffering she, she saw, she could do little to nothing to alleviate. Yet she was not consumed by it, nor did she have to shut down her feelings to deal with it every day. Over decades of service, she was able to help countless people, thousands upon thousands. This same woman who lived with the horrifying consequences of human neglect and uncaring once said, if you judge people, you have no time to love them. Instead of focusing on judging those who could have who could have helped but didn't, she focused on the power of love to impact the lives of everyone around her. She did not let she did not let what was around her every day make her jaded or numb. She opened to it, and she was able to do this because of her deep connection to her soul. One thing you never see see said or written about Mother Teresa is that she was weak or ineffective. When we move to learn when we learn to move towards our circumstances, no matter how daunting, we are able to maintain our center. If force of some kind is required, we are able to apply it appropriately. We are able to maintain balance, feeling the steady center point inside us. This center is your soul. Your soul will become the truth to which you orient as you interact with life, because nothing and no one knows you better. Simply being who you are and remaining rooted in yourself will, be, will begin to influence your surroundings. All that is around you will relate to you differently and you to it, simply because of the way you walk in the world. And we'll stop there. And that is page 28 in the book. You guys could definitely um, download the book off the website and read some more. Um, so now we will talk to uh, Gary York. We will give Gary York time to talk about his experience and how the information in the book relates. And then afterwards, we will ask some questions. Well, now I'll introduce Gary York. Gary York um, has had 28.8 years of experience in the Florida Corrections Department um, on many different levels. He is a Corrections One columnist, and he is um, an author, uh, along with a you know a loving family, uh, hu husband, family member, father, and grandfather to many kids. So we will hand it off to Gary. And Gary, you have the floor. Well, thank you very much for having me today, and um, everybody that's here and joined us today. Thank you very much. Um, I have 38.8 years in government work. 10 years was in the uh, military, and then between the other 28.8 years, I worked half of that with the state prison system in Florida and finished my second half of my career in corrections with the Polk County Sheriff's Office here in Florida. And um, I'll tell you, uh, this job is not for everyone. My brother completed 23 years at his local police department, and he said he would not be able to work within the jail or prison system. And we hear that a lot. This job is not for everybody. It's a tough job. It's a stressful job, and you were doing it behind the walls with no weapons, mainly no weapons. Um, and I um, am proud to be uh, a team member of Unconditional Freedom Project, uh, Guards to Guardians. Um, I appreciate what you are doing for everyone because your program is for the officers, the civilian staff that have to work behind the walls as well. And you're also uh, helping the inmates because uh, that's why we're there, aren't we? We're there because we have the inmates, care, custody, and control. And as I told you in, a, in another interview we did, um, my first impression of your uh, guards to guardians is uh, chicken soup for the soul. If you remember me telling you that, it's good for the soul, the mind, the body, and the spirit. And when I was a drill instructor, mind, body, and spirit, that's what we were trying to, to get everyone involved with, get in tune with, get yourself evenly squared away as we called it in the military. Um, but I like your program as well because it's helping to educate officers to know that they can go somewhere for help when they need it. And we need to further educate officers to realize you're not alone because loneliness, 
is a big stressor. Loneliness is a huge stressor. Stressor. None of us are alone, but sometimes we feel like we're alone. And you have to know, we have to get the message out to officers that you're never alone. We'll always be there for you, but we need to tell them that. We need to get that message out there. We need to give them a mentor, a point of contact. So I love what your program is doing to also bridge the gap between the staff and the inmates, because not only for the correctional officers, if we can save one inmate out of 10, I'm just throwing a number up there. I don't, I would love to save more, but if we can turn the life around of one inmate out of 10 and they leave the jail or the prison and have a successful life. And I know many that have, they're my contacts right now. I don't have a problem having contacts with people who've turned their life around. And, and that's why I like your program so much. And I, and I just love being a part of it. Right on, Gary. Thank you. Um, you and you can you have uh, more time if you want to talk about more of your experience and, and corrections and how you've seen it come up for you as well. Yes, I'd like to talk about some bad things that I've seen. Uh, we worked at the sheriff's department, and my wife and I were on the same shift. She she's retired uh, correctional officer as well, and this was with the sheriff's office. So we were detention deputies. We worked the same shift, and we worked with this officer who was a quiet person, very squared away, always ran his dorm very well and never had a problem with the inmates. But he didn't talk to us very much, the, the crew, the shift. And that's fine. There are a lot of officers that kind of stay to their self. But we always thought of him as a good officer squared away. We come to briefing one morning and the lieutenant says everybody sit down sit down we're going to get started quickly i have some bad news and he told us that this officer had committed suicide the night before now you know as working with this man and knowing that he was squared away it was just hard to comprehend why would he do that uniform squared away dorm squared away the inmates never gave him any problem he never gave the inmates any problem what was going on in this man's head. I wish, everybody on the ship wished he would have just come to one of us, just give, give one of us an inkling that something's wrong and maybe that would not have happened. And that is just an example of why we need your program, why we need to further educate officers that they can come and talk to other officers. It's not an embarrassment to have a problem, okay? Uh, we've all had problems in life, okay? No one is exempt from having a problem in life. And you've got to talk about that problem. You've got to, if you don't want to go to a fellow officer, then seek someone on the outside that you trust very well and you want to talk to. Seek a family member, an uncle, a cousin, a best friend, something. But please get the message out there. There is nothing to be embarrassed about because the feeling of loneliness and nowhere to turn is such a huge stressor to the body combined with whatever your problem is that you're going through, whether it's divorce, depression, alcoholism, drug use. Unfortunately, now we all know that this is one of several of the things that occur among correctional officers based on stress, based on um, seeing things in the prisons or jails that, that affect them, maybe not right away, maybe five or 10 years later. So I wanted to use that example today to show that none of us are built with a bulletproof vest. None of us have a force field around our body to protect us. We're all human. Let's help each other, talk to each other and back each other up when we have a problem and never be embarrassed. Right on, Gary. Um, yeah, I, I had the thought of like, what is it, what do you think is needed for, you know, for corrections officers to be able to reach one another, you know, in, in that sense where, you know, if someone's having a problem, like how do you see, um, you know, like being able to get into that position and being able to talk to a fellow officer and having them open up, you know, where, how do you see it be, 
where do you how do you see it not being effective and how do you see how do you see it being effective well it won't be effective if we don't get the word out there and who gets the word out you know we have human resources department available to every agency we have management you know from the sergeant right on up to the wardens uh in the in the sheriff's department right on up to the sheriff we need to constantly, not just once a year, say, hey, we have programs available if you need help for financial problems, marital problems, depression. We need to constantly let our officers and uh, civilian staff know what's available to help them, why it's okay to come forward, and Come forward at any time and we will keep it confidential if you wish, but we're gonna help you somehow, some way. We have to let everyone know that there is help for them. And if we don't communicate this on a regular basis, officers are gonna tend to shy away and, and, and not come forward and speak with us. Right on. And then, you know, speaking to the stresses of the job, you know, in your experience, you know, when is when like in the chapter one, as it says, how do you open up to a stress that comes forward and seeing it as an opportunity to, to do that? You know, how would you say that's shown up in your life, in your experience? Well, you know, stress can be a good thing. So in this instance, if you're a little stressed, I think it makes you a little more aware, a little more on the ball. Um, Fear, you know, in the military, we always said uh, having a little fear is good. Fear is not a bad thing. So if you have a little fear, a little stress, my opinion, from my experience, I think that's a good thing because now I'm going to be more alert. Now I'm going to have my head on the swivel. Uh, you have to be aware of your surroundings. You have to uh, watch patterns of behavior uh, from the inmates. You know, it's a dangerous job. You're, you have a chance of being attacked on any day you come to work in corrections by an inmate. Uh, you have the chance of seeing someone commit suicide every day you go to work in a jail or prison. Now, let me preface that by saying we work hard to prevent suicides in jails or prisons. But when you have 1,100 inmates in a prison and 36 officers on duty, you can't watch every single inmate every minute of the day. You know, so we we have to deal with suicides and attempted suicides. You're going to see a homicide, maybe, in your career, an inmate on inmate homicide. So you're seeing death, you're seeing suicide, you know, you're seeing depressing things. Now, there are positive things that happen with education and programs and, and uh, counseling. We can talk about that later, but there are success stories in prisons and jails. But right now we're talking about things that stress you out. All these things, you have to figure out how you're gonna control that inside your body. Can you manage these stressors? Some people can manage these stressors much better than others. And some people just can't handle it. It, it gets to them pretty bad. Again, we need programs available and they need to know that they're there to help them get over the hump. Fellow officer passes away, I just saw a suicide, I think I need to talk to somebody. Uh, make it mandatory, Kyle Diaz, to everyone. Absolutely, thank you for that. We have to make these things available and mandatory uh, for people to come forward and tell us what's going on. We're, we're here to help you. So you're gonna have to dig down deep in your soul as an officer or a civilian employee working in prison jail. You're gonna have to dig down deep in your soul and ask yourself, can I handle this? Can I handle that? Did that affect me, what I just saw? And if it did, just get some help, please. That's what we want you to do. Uh, stressors can be good and stressors can be bad. St stress and fear can save your life, but stress can also destroy your body from the inside out. So we've got to have programs in place that will fight all of these angles, you know, keep it equal. A triangle has three equal sides. We have to keep ourselves uh, congruent, ourselves in, in step. Well said, Gary. And I think a follow-up question from Trish, which was uh, brilliant. It's like, how do you 
how do you break the stigma of feeling weak and embarrassed uh, for CEOs? You know, because CEOs don't like admitting that they need help. You know, so how do you break through that stigma in the culture um, in corrections? That's a great question because, you know, the stigma of correctional officers is nothing bothers me. I have a hard shell. I can handle all this. And again, I would say in answer to that question, we need to, if you, if you are in an agency that has enough time for briefings, I just came from an agency that had 15 minute briefings. We need to put out there supervisors, hey folks, we're not made of steel. We're not supermen and women. We have, uh, you know, uh, uh, emotions. So don't think that you're not being tough if you come forward and tell us that you need assistance for something. You know, it's the same as being on duty. I'm calling for backup, right? It's only one inmate causing a problem, but I'm calling for backup. That's because I know that uh, I'm not embarrassed to say I need help with this inmate. Sometimes somebody wants to do it all on their own, be, be the hero. Hey folks, let's all work together. We'll be heroes together as a team, not single, not a single hero, because being a single hero gets you hurt or gets you sick. Well said. Um, we'll go to comments from Steve and then we'll get Kyle's question. So Steve added, it takes a strong person, maybe a supervisor to start asking for their help and then letting people know they did. We had several certain certificate members talk to HR and then told everyone, and that helped break the ice for a period of time. That's awesome, thanks. Great addition, yes. Steve. Yeah. Um, and Kyle, we'll go to Kyle for his question. So um, I think as speaking from personal experience here, I think that, um, I think Gary's right. I think that COs definitely have a, I don't know if you want to call it a um, problem with admitting help or an ego or whatever you want to call that. Um, and I definitely do that thing. But I think that, I think that what goes along with it is I don't think that, um, I, I think it's less about admitting that they need help. I think, I think what it is, is more about um, standing out. I think that, um, you know, I, I, I think that they, they don't, they don't want to do anything. I think most CEOs don't want to stand out from a crowd. I think that it, I think, and by doing it, saying you admit help, I think that subliminally, or I should say subconsciously, I think that most CEOs think that if they ask for help, that they're different from everyone else who doesn't seem to need any help. Or, or that's the perception is, well, everyone else can do it, I must be different, or there must be something wrong with me. So I'd rather just not admit that there's something wrong with me. But I think that, um, and I didn't realize it until Gary said something, I think that if it's mandatory, then everybody's the same. I think if we, I think if supervisors are asking, and I can tell you from personal experience, I used to have a supervisor that would pull people aside if he saw that you know, they were having a, a bad day or, or especially bad day, or uh, if there was any sort of death on the complex, if there was any sort of significant incident, he would immediately pull them in as soon as they had a free moment to check on them in private and just genuinely ask, are you okay? Do you need anything? Here are the resources. I'm here. Everyone's here. We're here. Um, that was only one supervisor out of all the supervisors that I've ever had. Um, I'm not speaking for corrections as a whole or the entirety. I'm just speaking from my point of view. So again, I think um, just to reiterate, I don't want to, I don't want to uh, sound like a broken record. I think that the, 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 the issue is not admitting the help. I think the issue is that um, more so that they're standing out or that they're different. COs don't like to be different. That's why we wear the same uniform. We all want to, we all want to be on the same page. Nobody wants to admit that they may be different. Um, or, and I think by admitting that they need help, I think some CEOs feel like they're different from every other CEO. Like why, why do I need the help? Why, why do I feel this way? So I just rather suppress it. I just rather not get the help because I want to blend in. I don't, I don't want to cause it attention to myself or, 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 or what have you. Um, no, that's a great, that's a great addition. So, um, yeah. Well, well said, Kyle. Um, Trisha raised the hand so you can jump on in Trish. Thank you. Um, 
in my experience in the last 15 years um, over here in Australia, um, we have an incident, maybe a hostage situation, a suicide, a bad use of force. We'll have a debrief straight after the incident. So all those people involved are called together and the um, management will say, job well done, we could have improved on this. And they say, does anyone need counselling? This is probably half an hour after the incident. Our adrenaline's still high. We're still processing what happened. They're worried about getting our reports in. So even though they were asked if they wanted any help, any counselling, we're all going to say no because we still haven't processed what happened. The check-ins should be three, three days after, five days after, after that officer has had a chance to process exactly what happened. Now, I ring everybody that's been in a serious incident um, and I do get a lot of people to open up and admit they need help. But if I've been in an incident and I've seen a lot in 15 years, I know I've sat there and said, no, I'm okay, when I'm not. So I think that the debriefs that happen after incidents should be made after the incident three and five days later. Just my opinion. Oh, that, that is a great point, Trish. Um, Gary's nodding his head, so you can jump on in, Gary. Well, yes, I, I like both of those comments. The first comment about the supervisor pulling people to the side. Remember when I said it starts with the sergeant all the way up to the warden. And I agree 100% because I had a one supervisor as well that would pull people to the side. Do you need anything? How's everything going? And if you remember earlier, I mentioned we can even keep it confidential. So that supervisor that was mentioned earlier that pulls people to the side, that officer can say, look, uh, I'm embarrassed because you talked about uh, ego. That's part of the play that comes into this. I'm different than some than the rest of the officers. Very good point. But I'm embarrassed as well. Uh, that supervisor could keep it confidential and then have the officer go to someone in human resources for help, right? We can do that. And then what you just said, uh, the lady, uh, the officer from uh, Australia, great point. Don't wait for three, four days later. I love it. Bring everybody together 30 minutes, an hour after the incident. Ask anybody if they need some help because of what just occurred and the riot that you, I think you use that as an example. What a great example because riots create hostage situations. They create a great danger to, to the other inmates not involved in the riot and to the uh, officers. So I, I think those two folks really um, were on the point. Yeah, I think, you know, like, like Trish has uh, to do both, you know, how do you ask them, like you guys said, how do you get help? How do you get the officers the help they need now? And then also remembering to follow up on them because it's something that can, you know, kind of like, um, a slow process, a slow trip. Um, you know, someone, someone liked to tell, I think it was uh, Gregory, uh, not Gregory, sorry. Yeah, actually, no, Gregory Piper, he, he told me this. He's like working in corrections is like um, a frog boiling in water. And, you know, the frog is in water and doesn't know, but if you turn the heat up, it'll slowly and slowly um, kill the frog. So I think that's something, it's like, how do you keep a followed regimen to, to follow up on other officers? So those are great points. Um, I'll open the door for anyone else, if anyone else wants to say anything. Oh, there is, I think uh, This is Keith Elwick. I don't know if you guys can hear me very well. I'm on the road. Yeah, we can hear you, Keith. Go for it. Okay, sorry I missed part of it. I was watching a rambunctious three-year-old without the benefit of a taser or OC, so I had to miss part of the program. Uh, as far as talking about staff debriefing, I know when I was a captain and we'd have a critical incident, uh, like Tina said, I would hold a debriefing immediately afterwards because I felt it was important for officers to be able to get things off their chest and to just be able to say what was going on at the moment. But also, I agree with her that follow-up is necessary. And I, I can recall an individual, uh, we had a 19-year-old man hang himself and it was all new staff that came across it. And I got them all together for a debriefing and we talked about it. And it's something I'd been through before. 
So I knew what they were going to be feeling, and I told them what they were going to be feeling, that they were going to second guess themselves, that they were going to say, I should have done this, I should have done that. And I also told them they did the best they could with the training that they had, and that's what they need to keep telling themselves. You know, and everything I talked to them about were things that I had experienced, so I was speaking to them on a personal level. I did do follow-up with them three days later, five days later. Some of them came to me a month later and said, you know, uh, Captain, everything you told me that I was going to be feeling, I felt it. But they weren't ashamed to share that because they realized that other people felt it, whether it was me as their captain, whether it was another sergeant that was in the room or whomever. I I can't stress the importance enough of being able to, to talk to staff, to talk to other staff. You know, and that's one of the things I'm getting out of the uh, guards to guardians. It's just the communications aspect of it. I think that's very important. I think that's very critical. And, uh, you know, I appreciate being a part of this program as well. So thank you. Thanks, Keith. That's well said. That's well said. Um, uh, do you want to speak on that, Gary? Go for it. And then we'll get well, to I just, I just want to say that Captain Keith Helwig, I've done training we've, with him. We've traveled, you know, to Vegas with Tear Talk, Anthony Ganji, we've all done training together for correctional officers. Keith and I have been to the Tennessee Department of Corrections and given uh, uh, training over there. And Captain Keith Helwig is the, the kind of guy that you would want to work for because of what he just said. He will listen and he will pay attention to what you tell him as an officer. And when officers hear from somebody like Captain Keith Helwig, they say, there's just something inside the humanism aspect, the psychological aspect kicks in and you, and you feel like, okay, he's sincere. So I'll stop right there with bragging about Captain Keith Helwig. Tune in next week, folks. He's going to be your uh, host next week or guest next week. <laughs> well said, Gary. Well said. Um, yeah. And, and, and Keith, you know, says, you know, brought up a great point, you know, kind of how you eat yourself after and wondering, second guessing yourself, you know, if you did, if you did your best or, and I think we all do that. We all do that, you know, just people in general is if, when we're in an event like that. So how do you process? So that was a great point, Keith. Um, and we'll go to Steve. You can come on in. I think you're still out there you go. Yes, I'm here. Uh, I think Gary will agree with this. I'm retired police before I got into corrections. And I would say that police and corrections handle critical incidents different. Police have more formal training, uh, the command staff do. I was a defensive tactics instructor, went to a lot of use of force training. So I was included with supervision to go to, as a police officer, to crit critical incident debriefing. When officers were involved in shootings in our department, on the sheriff's department, I would go and debrief them. And it was separate because in, in law enforcement, the police side, they quickly want to get psychological people involved, the outside people, the staff psychologists. They go to that route really quick. They want to get the blessing from them and get you returned to work. So I kind of took it upon myself because these are guys I work with involved in shootings to follow up with them, you know, like the day after. I, they were really busy the night of the incident. So the day after three days and five days, that is perfect. You know what she said, you have multiple times to follow up. I would also, I remember my buddy, Mike, uh, I won't say last things. He was involved. Uh, it was a hostage situation. He was in the house. Suspect came out with a 30-30, pointed at the officers, and he shot him in the stomach. And we had a discussion the next day. We had a couple days after that. And I asked, how do you, you have two teenagers. How do your kids feel about this? How does your wife feel about it? And he gave me the answers. You know, his wife was not surprised. His kids were okay. But it was all over the news and the media. And he was real excited and thankful that I did ask him, how does your family take this? He already told me his opinion. And I knew how he, he was probably a 12-year veteran. So it wasn't anything new for him. Getting into corrections, you know, I was 48 years old when I started. You know, I've talked with Anthony and, and Russ Hamilton and about this before. You know, coming in a later age with my experience was unique for me. But right away, I worked at a level five max security prison and multiple stabbings weekly. The inmates were just pretty much at war. 
So our new officers recruited at 18 right out of high school started seeing real trauma real fast and death. So because of my experience, one of our deputy wardens had also been a, a police officer on the road. He and I talked and I said, look, I'll, I'll come to help these people. I've seen, I've been through things. So I, I'll come right to do it. And it made a difference if I wasn't there at the prison to volunteer for this, who would have? So like in the comment before, it takes a supervisor really to stand up and, and put the testosterone aside. And yes, I'm, I'm an alpha male, like a lot of people that work in corrections are. I've trained and taught people to become alpha male. But there's a time I'll take that off, put a suit and tie on or whatever I need and say, you just witnessed this. We've just taken somebody down that's committed suicide by hanging or by cutting. We need to talk. And then you need that day, that, that one day, three day, five day, because unlike the police where they're trying to push you to a psychologist, it is just the people in the prison now. It is your sergeant, your lieutenant. HR is trained outside and they're afraid to reach out and tell somebody like that. So it would take somebody that's kind of quick first person. I'll throw this out really quick and, and send it back to Gary. As a police officer, one of my two best friends after I retired, we don't know why, he shot himself in his cruiser in the driveway. My best friend in high school got involved in drug trafficking. I was off in the military. He was 19, you know, first job, started making money, living with mom and dad, got an apartment. What I was told when I came back from overseas was the DEA showed up. He was coming home, he saw the his I think you froze up, Steve. Oh, you're back. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. And so my, my closest high school friend, uh, I guess I'll, I'll probably carry that burden in my life to want to help somebody. So you, you cut up a little bit there, Steve, but I think that ending um, and sharing that story, I think that's kind of, you know, that's big. That's key right there. It's like how to, as correctional officers, come and, and share those stories to kind of, you know, just see that, you know, um, for officers to see one another in these locations without feeling like, oh, hey, like the, I've had a similar experience. So I was, appreciate your share there. Um, I'll give it to you, Gary, to say a comment before I get, I pass it off to Marcus for a question. Yes, um, Steve hit, hit several points. One, I want, I want to talk about family. He mentioned family. And, you know, we haven't talked about that yet because things that happen at work go home to the family. Now, a lot of people say, as soon as you walk out that door, forget work and don't take work home. Well, that's easier said than done. Because if you've just gone through a terrible ordeal at work, and you're driving home to your family, it's, it's hard to walk in that door and just shut that off and forget about it. Some people may be able to do that, but uh, family sometimes may have to be involved in, in counseling as well. We cannot forget the family. And I'm glad Steve brought up the word family because it triggered that in, in my mind to talk about that just a, a bit. And um, never forget the family. They may have to be involved in some of this counseling as well which would be up to a mental health professional not not me but it would be up to a mental health professional to decide should the wife be brought in on this you know so forth well said gary uh marcus first gary thanks for your lead uh fantastic and i i, I think it it opened your, your lead was great and it opened up such a beautiful discussion here. And I think that's a, a, a testament, you know, to how, how uh, open and honest you were willing to share. Thank you. Um, I had a question, you know, we've been talking about, uh, we've been, we're working very closely with a, a sheriff at a jail in Northern California. And um, he's very interested in the Guards to Guardians program and, and has, has asked to discuss ways to implement it in, in his jail with his staff. And, um, I was curious from you guys, you know, I, I look out at you guys and see all these guys who are kind of dedicated to being, 
this kind of beacon of light, you know, within your own community of officers. And then I'm contrasting that with um, this idea of um, institutionalizing, in a sense, some of, you know, some of these principles in, in regards to guardians and, 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 you know, all the ideas that you guys are sharing on this Zoom. And I wondered, you know, do you have suggestions or ideas of how you think a, um, how you think a kind of a, a corrections, um, you know, staff wellness program of, of some kind uh, could work at an institutional level? What, what would be some practices to put into place? What would be, you know, uh, um, uh, would it be talked about at briefings? You know, would there be check-ins with people scheduled every day? Do you have any suggestions of how it could work with, with a facility? We, ha we always had, um, at our sheriff's department, we always had a, a, a employee email, okay, to get the word out. We want to get the word out on, on an event that's available, on help that's available. We did it by email. So we had uh, over 1,700 employees in our sheriff's department. So uh, an employee wellness uh, program or a new idea for employee uh, wellness could be sent out in a professional email by the sheriff. If it's a state prison, it would be sent out by, uh, like for me, example, Tallahassee, the secretary of corrections would have to approve it and send an email. But before any emails would be sent, every agency would want to review the program. So I would get with sheriffs, secretaries of corrections, and give them what you've got to have them review it. And something that's very important, and I already know from something we discussed earlier, that there's a few folks out there in the country right now that are happy with your program. And something about the corrections world, new things are not always welcome, although they should be. So when you can show that there's a warden out there that likes your program, or a sheriff who loves your program, or a psychologist at a prison who loves your program, when you present your package to these folks, you need to put these people in there with their permission, saying these, this warden likes it and here's why. This psychologist likes this program and here's why. Uh, this sheriff loves our program and wants to further advance with it, here's why you're kind of cementing in the minds of the people you're talking to that this is being used by others in their field, in their corrections field. Well said, thanks Gary. Thanks Gary. And then what, how would you, how would you integrate, let's say this idea of like checking in, uh, you know, on how people are feeling creating a kind of space, a time right. and a space for that conversation on a regular basis. How would you, how would you implement that as a, as a protocol into a schedule? If you could get an agency to do this, you can do it by the supervisor pulling everyone to the side individually and asking them how they're feeling, how they're doing, or you could leave it with human resources. Human resources can be the ones that could schedule everybody to come in. I know we're short staffed. I know time is always an issue, but human resources could schedule appointments for officers to come in for a 15 minute visit and do their questionnaire with them. So you could use the human resources personnel who that's what they're really there for, right? To, to help everyone human. Whenever we need help, we usually go to human resources with our finance or or anything. So get the human resources department on board with the approval of your sheriff or, or secretary and get them to do some questionnaires for you. Maybe write out a questionnaire and see if you can get that approved. A questionnaire would have to be confidential, obviously. And that would mean human resources would probably have to be the one to do it, to tell them where this is confidential because they handle the confidential issues. Thanks, Gary. Thank you, Gary. Go to Kyle real quick. Um, yeah, so just tree branching off of uh, what, uh, what Mr. Mr. Gary just said, um, 
and this is uh, he kind of uh, he, he kind of answered the, my question um, towards the end of his um, towards the end of his statement. But uh, like I, I don't know about anyone else, but I work graveyards. Back, back when I, you know, um, I work graveyards, and HR was at the times that I was working to so try me for the night for the night crew for graveyards. Um, so that might be um, uh, an issue at some point somewhere. Uh, but I think a questionnaire works. I mean, and and just you know, uh, works in that sense because that's that you can just turn that in to your supervisor and they can give it to HR or something like that. Let me let me give you a quick answer. Also, Kyle, good point because I worked graveyard shift for, for years too. Um, we also had human resources come to us to each shift. Like, let's say insurance comes up, life insurance for correction officers. A human resources representative would be there with a life insurance person for each shift. So I'll tell you what, with the staff shortages and everything, you bring up a great point. Let human resources do a night shift. Set up in an office alone and have you guys get a 10-minute break each to run in there and talk to them. Because I remember uh, um, during that time of working graves, um, if we had anything that we had to run through HR, we'd have to go on our off time, which which is really inconvenient because, you know, we were tired. Like, we didn't want to go wake up and, like, go on our off time or, you know, things like that. So, yeah, I mean, that, that would have been nice to have something like that implemented in case you needed to do that just at we any point. We need to get everybody on board with the well-being of the officers. Yeah. For sure. Not their eight to five job in human resources. Let's start forgetting that eight to five and let's get down there and, and think about the well-being of the officers. What benefits you better? So yeah, your point is very valid. Well said, fellas. Um, and we'll pass it off to Trish. You got another question. You can hear me now. Yes, I can. <laughs> I'm just wondering, um, do your facilities have peer support officers? Do they have, um, like we have a, um, in each jail, we have a, um, we nominate staff that we can go and talk to. So they keep things confidential. They can escalate things if need be. Um, they're just there for support. Um, that works in a lot of institutions, but, I have been recently put in as a welfare officer for all of correctional officers in New South Wales. So I get informed of the serious incidents around the state. I will email them and every day. And then if they, if I, I if it's a serious incident, I will call them. Um, and I'm not sure whether you, your staff have lockdown days for training. So we have a lockdown day once a month. We're short staffed like you guys are. So we just um, sort of run really short staffed. But we have a lockdown day and we have training. And we put wellness programs in on those training days. We've got a program called Stand Taller. And it is about um, the, the mental health of our, um, prison officers, the... Um, noticing what, um, if, if I work with someone every day, I can notice that they're a little bit different coming in and I'll just go, are you okay? Half the time they're not. We know what our colleagues are like on a day-to-day -day basis. You can notice when they're not themselves. So, and this program puts in and breaks the stigma of mental health, talks about suicides. We've had a few suicides of staff lately and it's, it's heartbreaking. And to think that, and it's hard for the people that are left behind that work with these people because they go, why didn't I see it? And this is just training them on um, what to look out for and everything. So that's it. I've got more, yeah. but I will let someone else talk. <laughs> we'll, go, we'll go to Gary. We'll go to then Major Luis Soto, and then we'll go to Steve after. I think I saw Anthony, so we'll, we'll, and then we'll wrap up. Trish, what you said, um, I want to talk about two parts real quick about having someone for them to talk to available. I, 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 we call that mentors over here. And that's a great thing to have mentors. Now there's a guy named Russ 
Hamilton, who has Keepers of Chaos, and he talks a lot on Keepers of Chaos about uh, he's there and other people on Keepers of Chaos are there. If you have any questions, that would be a group that's outside the agency. But the agency as well should have mentors assigned, just as you said, Trish, in that example you gave. So, you know, uh, having a mentor is very important. I just gave uh, one that's an outside group that people can go to if they see this. Uh, Keepers of Chaos, Russ Hamilton, and then private message him about a mentor program. Um, the other part you mentioned, uh, training is very important. You know, we get training on uh, suicide prevention of inmates, uh, PREA. Prison Rape Elimination Act, a lot of things which we need. We have to have those to protect the inmates, but we need more training for uh, officers on mental health issues and where they can go. So thank you, Trish. Well said, Gary. And we'll go to Major Luis Soto. Good evening, guys. How are you? Um, I just wanted to chime in again here in New Jersey, right? We're from the East Coast and uh, we have plenty of things for officers in the department, you guys heard Anthony Ganji talk about last week, the SISM team, critical is it stress management team that goes to uh, different prisons, jails, whenever there's an incident that happens. So that's like the, the prison, the institution themselves doing their part, right? We have to help the officers. We have to deal with the sort of like the debriefing and, and be there for them. But there's another good program here in the East Coast called Cop to Cop, because, yes, you can say, like Gary says, we're not supermen or superwomen. I do consider ourselves superman, superwomen. You know, who else goes into these uh, individual prisons, institutions, right? And only with what God gives you, right? Your hands, your mouth, your demeanor, you know, your composure, constructive authority. We go in there, we're supermen and superwomen. But sometimes Superman and Superwomen have that kryptonite, and we need someone to talk to that's outside the department, right? Cop to Cop um, is a wonderful program because it's retired police officers, retired correctional officers, retired law enforcement, right? Who are now, they don't have that limitation of if you tell me something as a police officer on duty right now, a correctional officer on duty, that may hinder upon your job, saying you have issues with drugs, alcohol. You know, what's the first thing they tell you if you do that in the department, the, the formal way? Oh, we got to sit you down at a desk. We got to take away your weapon. We got to do this. We got to do that. So now you're limiting that officer and that stops us, the correction officers, from coming forward. But when you have a system like cop to cop, right, you're talking to retired folks that are going to steer you in the correct. And they're there 24 hours a day, 24 seven. So it's a wonderful, wonderful program. Um, and you guys asked for some ideas or advice, and we all love wellness programs. Superman and superwomen do not like going to wellness centers, wellness uh, anything, right? So maybe we start by changing the name. Don't call it wellness because the name itself, wellness, means if I go there and I talk to you, it means I'm not well. So it's semantics because we do want to get them in there first, because once you're there talking to people, then it brings the conversations out where, oh, yeah, I'm just like anybody else. So let's think of ways of saying, yeah, maybe it's not a wellness. Maybe it's a get together. You know, maybe it's a, you know, um, we get on Zoom, get together and we call it happy hour. But sometimes we're not drinking. Right. So we call it something other than wellness. But great. I think it'll, it is a great idea. It's great. Well said. Well said. Lewis. Appreciate that. Um, okay, I think we'll, we'll, we'll keep it here. And then I got you uh, for next week, Steve, because um, just because we're over time. Uh, but come back Thursday, same time. This has been a great conversation to share with everyone. Um, and just to show everyone, we have for next week, um, same time, we can come back, chapter two, uh, recognizing, recognizing what wants to move through you with Keith Helwig, um, who spoke earlier today. So we'll be excited um, to have him here. Uh, and Gary already put in a good a good call for for Keith. <laughs> yeah. Um, but this has been a pleasure. It's been a great, uh, uh, intriguing conversation. Really awesome. Um, really good key points from everyone. So it was great to hear everyone, having everyone share their story, uh, and thanking Gary York again for um, you know being our guy this week. We appreciate you and your time this uh, this time.
Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Appreciate you. Thank you, everybody. Uh, thanks, everyone. Until next week, same time. Be safe, everyone. Take care. All right, bye, everyone.